Hi there, it's May 29th and we're continuing our journey through the good news of John and we're in John chapter 18 reading from verses 1 to 24. Jesus has completed his teaching discourse to his disciples and it says they now leave the area of Jerusalem and they go out and they cross the Kidron Brook. The brook, the word in uh, Greek, actually means a winter flowing torrent. So maybe it's not so strong at this point, but they cross over and they go to a garden. It, John doesn't name the garden. We know it as the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, the, the, the oil press. And he goes there and it's there that Jesus is encountered by Judas Iscariot coming, leading a group of combined group of both Roman soldiers and Jewish temple constables, Jewish temple police. Uh, it's an interesting view here that John has that there are both Jews and Gentiles involved in the taking of Jesus. Um, John uses the word spira here to describe how many Romans come. This is perhaps the word translated best as cohort, which suggests a large number, around about 200 troops. This could be because of the fear of uprising, of public tension, but you'd think that at night this wouldn't be so necessary. Anyway, we've got this large force of Romans and we've got this makes smaller force of temple guards who've been sent to arrest Jesus. Uh, Jesus actually doesn't shrink from identifying himself. In fact, he steps forward and he says, who is it you're looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he then says something quite significant. It's, it's a normal word that he's saying. He says in Greek, ego in me, that means I am, this is me. But actually those words, ego in me, are for John very powerful words. They're the words, I am. They're the words that Jesus has been saying all through the gospel to identify himself as the door, the shepherd, uh, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, and, uh, and the light of the world, all these things. And so now Jesus says, ego in me, I am. And what happens is we don't know quite how, but there's a reaction by the temple guards and by the Romans. Maybe they fear what's going to happen next. Maybe Jesus, having used these words, is full of portent and they step back and they're afraid of getting hold of him. But then Jesus says, what are you waiting for? I've already said I'm the one you're looking for. And then Jesus actually defends his disciples and he says, listen, let these people go. They're not the ones that you're after. Release them. And actually, this is because Jesus says, I've not lost any of those who you've given to me. And uh, the, the, the John invokes the, um, the ancient scripture. And so they take Jesus, arrest Jesus, and they take him to the house of Annas. Now, Annas uh, is the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas. And it's a little confusing in this uh, this this um, account that John brings, because uh, Annas is also identifies as a high priest. Now, Annas had been a high priest. Annas was actually high priest from AD 6 to AD 15 uh, when he was deposed by the governor, uh, uh, Val, uh, Val, sorry, Valerius Gratanus, and he was the predecessor of Pilate and presumably Annas had got into trouble in some way and had stood against the Romans in in favour of the Jews and therefore he was deposed. But it seems that Annas had kept his real status with the people as being a high priest and so the people continued to see him as having a high priest office. His sons and his grandson and now his son-in-law Caiaphas also became the high priest. He had something of a dynasty going and so they take him to Annas first as having influence. Now remember this is at night and also the general procedures of a Jewish court were that witnesses would be brought and they would testify but it seems like Annas is trying to entrap Jesus. He's trying to get him to um, to 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 incriminate himself by saying that he has misled people. But Jesus says to Annas, look, I have been completely open. I've not hidden anything. I can't be accused of being a false prophet because I've not taught people secretly. I've been quite open in the temple preaching everything. And, and that's been recorded by John that Jesus has preached openly in the temple. So Annas can't uh, accuse him of teaching is secretly and of subversion. Now um, the way that Jesus 
uh, speaks to Annas, uh, invokes one of the people standing by to slap Jesus in the face and says, how dare you speak to the high priest like that? Jesus says something interesting. He says, if I've said anything wrong, then let it be proven. He doesn't just mean if I've offended the high priest. But Jesus says, if I've actually done anything wrong here, then it needs to be witnessed. There need to be witnesses to speak about this because that's how the procedure is properly done. And perhaps because Jesus hasn't given them what they want, for this reason, Annas, Annas dismisses Jesus and sends him to the proper procedure to the high priest himself, to Caiaphas. In the meantime, Peter is coming closer at a distance. Oh, by the way, in the garden, we read that Peter has actually taken matters into his own hands. When Jesus is arrested, he's taken a sword and he's cut off the ear, the right ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Um, and so he, he's tried to defend Jesus. But Jesus has said, don't do that. I, I can take this cup. This is the cup the Father has given to me. I'm not going to start trying to fight my way out. Put your sword away. So Peter, having done this, uh, this quite drastic deed, now follows Jesus at a distance. And maybe one of the reasons for his unwillingness to be identified as a follower of Jesus is because obviously he's committed an act of violence against one of the high priest's sermons. So he's following at a distance. But it also says that he's accompanied by another disciple who is a friend of the high priest uh, or a, even a relative of the high priest. We're not told who this disciple is. Some scholars want to identify it with being John the himself, John the disciple who writes this gospel because he doesn't always identify himself, calls himself the one who Jesus loves. But it could also, could also be another disciple, someone, a follower of Jesus, who happens to be close uh, to the high priest called in Greek a gnostos, one who knows an acquaintance or a connection with the high priest. And this gnostos, this connect, connection with the high priest, brings him to the point where he can get in to the courtyard of the high priest and see what's going on. And it's there that people Peter begins to be asked, hey, you were with him and you were one of them. And a, a young girl there who's standing in the courtyard asks him, you're one of them. And he says, no, I'm not. I've nothing to do with him. So here is Jesus on the one hand saying, I am identifying himself. And Peter on the other hand saying, I'm not with him. A sharp distinction between the two, just as Jesus said. We see here then the beginning of the unfolding, but we see Jesus still, his openness, his boldness, his standing up and to, to injustice, his standing up to the lack of equity and saying, look, bring forward your witnesses. I am innocent of these charges. And Annas, the high priest, the ex-high priest, who cannot get Jesus to perjure himself, and so sends him on to the process, because Jesus is going to be vindicated in that sense. He's going to be justified, as he said, uh, by the Holy Spirit, uh, and he's going to be seen to be innocent of the charges that are brought against him. Let us continue to follow Jesus. Let us continue to keep close to him as we trace his journey through to the cross and to the, to the resurrection beyond. Have a very good May 29th.